right, guys. Hey, welcome back to the Real Estate of Mind show, where we help everyday people build wealth through real estate investing. And I am your host, Glenn Schwarm, and my beautiful wife and partner, Amber Schwarm. Hello, everybody. Glad to have you here. She was not here the last time. She was out playing hooky, but we got her back this time, so it's great. Hey, we have another exciting guest here today, and uh, he's a member of a, of a group that we're a part of um, called Collective Genius, and uh, he is actually in the same state as us. So, I want to welcome on Mike Zlotnick, who runs a huge uh, equity fund we're going to talk about today in uh, in Brooklyn, New York. So welcome, Mike. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on your wonderful podcast. Yeah. So we were just chatting before this. We have. I, I want to start by asking, you, you had COVID while we, while we were together. In March. Yeah. Blame it on me. And uh, at the last Collective get- Genius Mastermind, uh, I had a little bit of breathing challenges and I thought I was having a heart attack. And apparently I didn't have a heart attack. I had COVID and I had breathing problems. I didn't know. I came back to New York. I didn't feel well. My wife sat asleep on the couch for a couple of days. I did. And that was the good news. I didn't infect her. I took a Z-Pack. And basically okay. recovered. I didn't know. And only a few, like about a week, week and a half ago, we, we took because we have some sick relatives in New York City. We just took a test just in case. Uh, we, and we took the test for COVID and we took the antibody test. And we're both negative for the COVID and my wife doesn't have antibodies and I do. And then I oh. put two plus two together and that must have been during the last CG. I, I had it and developed antibodies. So you here's know? the good news that the news doesn't share. People survive COVID. I know. <laughs> Not everybody dies. I know, I know, crazy. Yeah, but older people are at serious risk. That, that's one thing that uh, that totally. the whole approach is to uh, keep them safe. Um, people sick and, and elder are at serious risk. Uh, yeah, our mom's 83. My mom's 83, yeah. and she she's uh, she's a piano teacher. And to to cope through this, she actually starting on June 1st is doing virtual lessons now with her iPad and doing all that. So she's found a way to adapt, adapt and navigate through all this craziness like all of us. But Mike, tell all of our viewers a little about you. Tell us where you're from, what you do, and all that kind of stuff. Give us the give us the skinny. Sure. So I live in Brooklyn, New York. Married 20 plus years. Um, four kids and a cat. Fifth, the fifth <laughs> child. Nice. <laughs> uh, I actually immigrated originally from a former Soviet Union. When it was Soviet Union, that long ago, in 1989, and I moved to Rochester, New York, upstate oh. New York. I have a brother in Rochester. Okay, I, I, I'm in Spencer. I Paul. love upstate New York. I, I I went to college in Binghamton, New York. So I'm mm-hmm. as New York as it gets. Uh, my mother, who's turning 90, still lives in Rochester with my sister. And uh, concern is how we're going to co- go and visit her because she's 90 and she's at risk. Uh, right. But yeah. you know, it's the same issue with your mom. It's it's she's yeah. at home and. But that's a couple of words about me. And um, went to school in Binghamton, New York. Been in New York City you know, uh, since 96. Um, Tell us about your fund, because you, you've raised about $30 million, you said, in a fund. I'm, curi- I'm curious how that works in real estate and what, you're, what you do. and Yeah, and how COVID has affected that. Yeah. And what you're doing going forward. Sure. So uh, we have a few funds. Uh, we have income and growth fund called Tempo Opportunity Fund. We have growth only fund called Tempo Growth Fund. We have a few legacy funds um, and it's a series of funds. Each has their own focus and in real estate, it's better to have somewhat focus strategy. Uh, we raise money from high net worth individuals, um, just n- regular Joes. Uh, we do take uh, money only from accredited investors. We don't take accredited investor means that you have to have a million dollars of net worth outside of your primary residence, or have uh, 200,000 uh, income for the last two years, or 300,000 if you're married for, for a couple. Yeah. And we raise money mostly through network, mom, mom and pop connections. I don't know how else to call it, friends and family. So sure. we. And um, that's that's the basics. And we do invest in a range of um, real estate assets. So we do invest in fix and flip loans. Uh, okay. We kind of call it hard money loans. You obviously know that. Sure. sure. We continue to do the same loans with the same people, many CG guys and non-CG guys. We've been doing it for a long time. And um, uh, in the last three years, we've actually expanded significantly. Uh, into number of commercial um, deals. So we, we right. do have investments, broad range of, we like self-storage quite a bit, especially now in the recession, it's very recession resistant. We have four, four self-storage investments. 
We have a number of multifamily value adds with CG and non CG guys. Um, we have a few retail projects, uh, just a little bit of a softness in the portfolio, but in general, we have no hospitality. Uh, we like distressed commercial debt. It's one area of significant investment here in New York City. Even though it's an epicenter of the COVID, at the same time, there are great opportunities to invest in first lien mortgages. You can buy somebody else's um, defaulted loan from a bank. They okay. want the monkey off their back. We would buy it. And it's a slow process. It takes uh, time to foreclose. But if you buy it at the low investment to value ratio, like 50%, 55%, sure. Sure. you have- so Mike, do you, do you do lending nationwide or are you strictly in New York or what? So we do loans only with people who we know, like, and trust. We don't have a lending operation. I don't need any new lending business. So if you have wonderful audience, they would like to have more loans. I appreciate that this point we're not taking the new client relationships unless they come from a strong referral from somebody we know just sure. to be very clear about this sure. not for new uh, borrowers I'm curious when you mentioned commercial lending I'm curious what you see the future of commercial real estate with everything happening now and people staying home working from home I think people are starting to rethink some things I know we have in our company I'm wondering what your thoughts are with that Wonder what your your perspective is as a as a you know a fund manager and raising money and investing in commercial property. What do you what do you think, what do you see for the future there? So it's a great question. Uh, I you know I used to have a crystal ball. It, it was wonderful. It broke. <laughs> well, I, broke it I, I can't find another one for sale. So everything <laughs> I'm going to say is a matter of opinion. Sure. So COVID seriously dislocated number of commercial asset classes. Not all of them, but uh, it, it it broke hospitality. It broke retail. Uh, it, it, it's 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 hurting office uh, to a certain extent. Uh, multifamily is is slightly impacted. It, it, it is going to be impacted, but not as bad. Self storage barely, you know, it's a sneeze. Nothing really. Uh, Self storage likes the recessionary environment. Um, the industrial it depends. So uh, the COVID impacted different commercial asset classes differently. So. Uh, retail. Let's talk about a few specific asset classes. Retail sure. is going to be significantly dislocated because of a shift to e-commerce. Amazon effect, e-commerce effect. So generally speaking, the demand for retail will soften. Uh, shopping plazas with uh, gro anchored by a grocery and some service-oriented businesses will come back reasonably well. Enclosed malls are in deep, 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 deep trouble. So. Yeah. Right, so those uh, are likely going to see massive correction, 50, 60, 70 percent value drops on enclosed malls. Uh, on shopping plazas, there will be some corrections, depending on the um, location, depending on the type of tenants. Again, can't get rid of nail salons, even gyms, as uh, there will be social distancing and they will do whatever they need to do to improve safety, but they'll operate. The doctors, the the dentists, the, the basic stuff, people will still need that type of a services. So they'll exist, um, uh, but a lot of uh, uh, stores that otherwise uh, sold to consumer uh, with physical location will go virtual. And uh, big box retailers, you know, J.C. Penney filed, filed for bankruptcy. They're going to shut All down right. a whole bunch of stores. Yeah. That's retail. Retail, the retail shopping plazas will correct, hard to say how much, 10, 20%, but not as bad as enclosed malls. Yeah. Hospitality, hospitality depends on what hospitality, right? Big, big, let's just call it the high flag hotels, the Marriott's, the, the Hilton's, the uh, Hyatt's. In the long run, they'll do fine when the COVID uh, scare is over, they will continue to, to absorb most of the demand. The weak hotels will, uh, some of them will go out of business completely. So I do believe um, that uh, there will be a, a extended a low demand period of time. And unless you can raise a lot of money and persevere, you're going to go out of business. What's interesting is we have a project right now. We're looking for a conversion of an old Ramada hotel, which I call low flag. It's just, you know, one of these low brands into an affordable housing. That'll be a trend across many cities and towns where weak hotels with weak demand will need to be converted to affordable housing or something like that. I was just thinking that when you said that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the you know that's the land of opportunity here. Better right. use for that asset. Um, 
let's see, office. So office, some office will be redeveloped. I, I, I do have a couple of office projects on my desk that I've looked at, I'm looking at where they're considering redevelopment into residential. So if it's a building that can be redeveloped into residential in a good location, that's a better consideration than the office space because again, the trend and the pattern has been broken. People are used to working from home. There's less office space needed. So right. not all office is gonna go out of business, but the overall demand will soften for sure. So those three asset classes, again, uh, sort of retail, shopping, uh, hospitality, and um, office uh, will see some level of an impact. Again, hospitality and retail taking, you know, taking it on the chin. Yeah. Um, Mike, I, wanna, I wanna ask you about um, uh, multifamily in New York. Before we do, tell our listeners how they can get a hold of you, how they can follow you, all that kind of stuff. Just give them an idea how they can, how can they reach out to you? Easy to remember. You can't see me. I'm a tall guy. You, well, you saw me. I'm, 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 I'm 6'4". Yeah, you're a big boy. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. BigMikeFund.com. Again, BigMikeFund.com. And if you misspell it, BigMikeFund.com. I promise it's not a kinky site. <laughs> <laughs> you can't forget that name. BigMikeFund.com. Cool. So my question is, you're in New York. Do you have a question? I'm sorry. No, you go ahead. My, my, I... I uh, in New York, they've obviously stopped evictions, and uh, through August 19th, 20th, whatever it is, and I'm wondering how that's impacted your commercial investments. We've we have several, we have dozens of rentals ourselves we own, and you know we've been so far, knock on wood. So I got a couple people that are riding the system and screwing us, but I'm wondering what you're seeing in Brooklyn, being that we're both in New York. We all we get we're always mad. We get governed like you guys in New York City, right? We get the same rules and we're not the same people we get penalized not, not, not same <laughs> people is the wrong word not the same communities you know just different just obviously different worlds but i'm curious what you see down there in brooklyn so uh, i live in the socialist republic of new york city unfortunately i ran away from socialists in 1989 from communists unfortunately i don't believe socialism communism works it's a utopia but You're too right. many right. cities and towns in america are socialist friendly and i really think it breeds corruptions and, and redistribution of wealth and really not redistribution of wealth to the people who need it but to the bureaucrats in charge right. but that aside okay that aside the new york city does have one of the most difficult eviction rules anyway so they stopped all the evictions it's even worse now with the new laws that hit in 2020 right well, now you can't evict period now you cannot right you can't yeah. do anything but be, uh, before, there were new rules that made it difficult, and general ev eviction takes, uh, I don't know, a year, year and a half, depending on how bad the situation is. It's a long, 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 long process. So what I do with my properties, I've kept the rents well below the market for the longest time. And okay. it, it, it's, it's, it's a beauty and a curse. It's a curse because then, you know, it could be collecting more rent. The beauty, all my tenants are paying. They do not want to lose the opportunity to keep the rents below the market. It's an interesting strategy, which basically motivates my tenants to pay. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean this with all due respect, they got rents below the market, probably 10, 15% below the market, and they're treasuring this, and I'm not increasing their rents, and I'm very understanding and sympathetic. So from that perspective, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a friendly relationship with, with tenants. Um, now, if you're trying to maximize every buck, you will have some tenants that will decide, well, in this, this, now I don't want to get into politics, but That's rent good. strike and all that. Oh yeah. You here out there. So, so I haven't had to deal with it. All I could tell you is that the uh, storefronts, the retail space is going to be, is taking a massive beating. My wife is optometrist. We, we, we are renting the location and, a couple of empty places right next to us and the observation is the uh retail probably office uh pricing for new rents are going to soften up significantly we're already negotiating significant discount with landlord wonderful landlord but uh the demand for storefronts retail is just going to be dropping like there is no floor. There is a projection that 50 to 70 percent of restaurants in New York City are going to go out of business. Wow. Is that is that the projection? 50 to 70. Wow. Wow. Well, yeah, I saw I saw a report that restaurants can only survive about 17 days without cash flow. <laughs> so the, you know, the, the, it, it, 
it, they work on a tight it. margin and they need to have right. all the people they need to they have the seatings unless you have a chinese delivery service right who, who just right. basically told businesses it is delivery right if, they, if, they're, if they're building on sitting capacity and they have to spread the tables six right. feet apart and in, in demand no they can make it work, it's not work. It's, it just won't work so what would you tell a new investor i mean this is this is obviously unprecedented times that we're entering and we're going to be post COVID here pretty soon so what what area would you tell a new investor to focus on instead of chasing you know a million different rabbits uh, uh you know it's difficult for me to give advice to new investors um we work most of our investors who work with us we invest with us our folks with some level of again the career investors with significant capital if sure. you're an active investor you're a mover and shaker you're looking for deals at this point, um, you know, guys in CG, we, we know how it goes. Right now, oh, yeah. I would not take the risk of holding the assets for too long. If you can't find a good deal, flip it. Wholesale it, flip it. You certainly can build long-term wealth uh, by buying and hold strategy, but you need more capital. So if you're a new investor, flip until you build up capital to, to do other things. So if you're a new investor with limited capital, uh, flip. And if you have built some significant capital, uh, consider putting some money to work uh, on, the, with, on the right projects with the right you know, folks. I am not trying to promote myself, but I've been doing this for a long time. We have many investors and it's, we do a lot of work. It's important to find competent folks you want to deploy your money with. So if yeah. you're an active investor, fix and flipping, buy, buying actively, you will get best return on your money because you're active. If you want to go passive, you need to find the people who you know, like, and trust and deploy the money with them. That's a that's, simple strategy that you can, you know. Yeah. That's the second time you've said the no like, and trust thing. I actually wrote it down the first time you did. And that's something that we really believe in too. And that's something that we teach our students is re real estate and investing. It's all about relationships. You know, don't go around burning bridges. Don't go around doing shoddy work. You know, make make sure that you, the houses that you're renting out are, are quality houses for people. You also bring up another interesting point with your uh, lower rent strategy that I think is really creative. Yeah, and, yeah, and I, thought, so I want to talk about that too. Yeah, go ahead. That's another great thing about real estate. And you probably started that pre-COVID and that's what keeps your tenants. Many years ago, my tenants haven't left my apartments for a long time. And I don't know. I don't haven't. Had, I haven't had to rent an apartment in years. I, most of my stuff was bought years ago, and I've kept it. And um, it, maybe it's a legacy issue that I've been very slow to raise rents. Uh, well, your climate is very different than most of the country. I mean, I think your climate in in Brooklyn and all around the city down there. And tell, correct me if I'm wrong. I have the impression that the climate is. If you have a good deal on an apartment, you better not leave because you won't get a deal like that someplace else. You'll be very hard pressed to find a deal like that or find a place because there's sometimes more more people than there are places down there, it feels like, or decent places to live. That's is that a brilliant point. That is a brilliant point. So let me just comment on this. So in New York City is one of the very few places around the country when you're trying to rent an apartment and you're using an agent, you pay the agent, not the landlord, but you as the tenant. Oh the really? Agent. Yes. Oh, the yes. the so the tenant, the person that wants to pay, hires the agent. Yeah, the way it works. So typically, the agent, the, the landlord. Sorry, let me just make, clarify how it works. The landlord has listing agent. They so they list uh, the property for rent, and the listing agent lists the property and finds the tenant. Uh, the tenant pays the listing agent a fee for for rent. It's not the landlord. Uh, this is how okay. it works. The reason for the reason there. for this is this is actually because for you know, eviction is difficult. Sure. So let them pay an extra. It's generally a month and a half worth of rent. Let them pay that that extra fee. Depending, it could be a month, anywhere between one and two months. Say one and a half on average. If they pay this, stickier. So I, it's, a I supply, hope that it's a supply demand. Again, an overpriced apartment. Overpriced. Yes, you could you could put it on the on on the uh, on the landlord. But if a if apartment is priced well, uh, the demand is higher than the supply. And the landlord says, listen, you Mr. Agent or Mrs. Agent, go ahead. You could rent the property for me, but collect your own fee from the tenant. Well, we we started our bid. I want to go back to your your raising money from private investors. We because you have the passive versus versus active investing. And 
when we started, you know, we, we started back at the last turn of the century. So we started our investing business and we bought our first house in 2007, flipped it in 08 when the market was tanking and we sort of built our empire, done over 600 houses since then. And, you know, we've been growing ever since then. So um, we have done that through raising private money from mom and pops, yeah. just people. And, and it's all about no like and trust. It, that's it's to the point now where there there's you know they just know what we do and they don't even they don't even make a lot of questions they just they here's you know we need money for this no questions boom boom is my my CFO will send a text to them send an email and they'll send a form over and they send paper money back and you know that no like and trust is a powerful even no matter what money level you get to no like and trust is really important i think that you can you know like you said and you've heard it said before it takes years to build trust it takes one mistake to crumble it uh, so I think it's important that you maintain that integrity piece. Obviously, you have in your business. These are the words of the wise man. You are wise beyond your <laughs> years. Yes, that well, is the you. truth. That is the <laughs> truth with um, with trust. It takes years to build, and you can destroy it overnight. So, yeah. yeah and, and if you're an active person, it's building relationships with other folks around you that, that have some money lying around, earning nothing in a bank. And if you're a competent operator, you could borrow the money for fix and flip project. And if you know how to do the work and you buy right, you'll make money on the deal, you'll be able to pay them, everybody wins. Agreed, yeah. that's the basics of real estate. Yeah. I hope our listeners really grasp the, the need and the availability of being creative though. You know, with real estate in particular, there aren't necessarily these black and white rules that you have to follow. You can come up with creative financing, you can come up with creative ways to keep your tenants to stay and pay their rent. There are so many creative aspects to real estate that can make it such a viable option for people. Yeah, when you're building- I'll, I'll, I'll comment on that. Those are the the words of the wise woman. So I mean this with- <laughs> And you're wise enough to acknowledge that. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, babe. You're my favorite guest ever. <laughs> uh, I try to correct a joke here and there. But <laughs> what you just said makes ton of sense. So real estate is all about creative financing. I do a lot of financial engineering and commercial deals. And it's music to my ears. But here is Wait, the financial engineering. I like that. Financial engineering. Cool. Because a lot of commercial deals, people come in and they want to do this project. And you start thinking through the whole capital stack, just fancy terms, how much equity you have, how much debt. Uh, and how do you structure the deal and does it make economic sense first? But back to the basics, to creative finance, it is even more relevant now than ever before. Why? Because a lot of lenders pulled out. So getting yeah. financing now from banks has gotten harder. Commercial deals for sure. Residential, if you can get Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, one of these uh, loans, you're in good shape. If you cannot try to get a uh, portfolio loan for a rental property, it's right. hard, gotten, gotten, gotten a whole lot harder. So creative finance kicks in even more. You can come in and to Mr. Seller and say, Mr. Seller, I'd love to buy your property, but I can't get a mortgage. I want to pay your price. Can you do some seller financing? Right. And if you yeah. can work that out, suddenly uh, they may have a good existing mortgage. That continues to be, uh, that, that's I think an area of opportunity today, especially now when it's getting harder to get new financing. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's so very true. You have, it, it's, I've almost, I've been studying real estate for my whole adult life, 30 years I've been in business for, but I've been doing real estate for what now, 15 we've been doing real estate for. And it's, I mean, sometimes you forget more than you remember. And so you, all of a sudden these things come back. Now when you're, I, I told my team, I said, guys, we've been doing business a certain way. Now we have to get more creative with some of these people. And like you said, like, we can pay them more money, but be creative. And at the end of the day, it's still the same amount of money for us. We just had that conversation last week about, you know, when we first started, we did a lot of like grassroots efforts in finding houses. We bought some stuff off the MLS even. And now we do, you know, how much in marketing on TV do we spend a month? Our total marketing budget is like 40000 a month. So like $40,000 a month. And it's like, okay, how do we scale our marketing budget back and go to finding those better deals that we did when we didn't have to spend that much money to get the phone to yeah. ring. Well, you learn as you go, right? I mean, in every business. Yeah, you, you, you guys go. are unbelievable. I remember from the CG, uh, the jingle, uh, how you do that, it's it's remarkable. We are trying to learn. We haven't really marketed for money. We've grown organically. And now we, we, we are uh, chatting about potentially radio and TV. It's a mono, it's a, it's, let's have a separate conversation, but we're trying sure. to learn how to do this. And uh, yeah, because we have a great product and, um, the capital raising, you know, we're finding your own deals. For us, it's, it's we're finding the capital. We don't need the deals because we have a phenomenal deal flow. It's yeah. a different exercise, uh, but 
at the end of the day, it's, it's creative finance, uh, especially now. If you are getting leads, uh, you've heard this phrase before, it was used many times in the past in CG, no lead left behind. So anytime yeah, you have, yeah. and there, there are plenty of deals that uh, don't make sense to just buy because the price is too high, but in creative finance, um, it, it does, so. Yeah. So we our big our main company is called Vestor Pro. That's what puts on our there's an educational piece. We we've got a few businesses we run, like you have got some a lot of things going on, but we um our our company our our podcast is called A Real Estate of Mind. It's off of off the Billy Joel New York song, right? So we what I want to ask you is how do you what do you do? Yeah, we we're big believers that you have to be right in the head. You know, you've got to hear it in the head to be able to get mentally strong. Mentally strong and stay mentally strong to get the money to actually flow into you and success, prosperity. What do you do to keep yourself positive? What are, what's kind of some tips and techniques or books you've read or people you follow or what's what's kind of, what do you do to keep yourself mentally in the game all the time? You have an interesting background because you came from a what when I, when I grew up, we're probably the same age or ish. I, when I grew up, that seemed like a tough country to live in, right? That we were kind of like enemies back then, the Cold War and all that. And it, you know, it, it we weren't enemies, but our countries were. And so it was. It, it seemed like a very tough mindset that you maybe were, maybe. And I'm very curious what you do to to keep yourself strong mentally. So I appreciate the questions. I'm I'm going to kind of go back to the. Um, uh, yeah. So I grew up in the former Soviet Union and. Um, when all the Russians come over, they don't smile. That's one of the interesting things here. Yeah. Americans smile. If you meet me on the street, I, I've learned a little bit to to smile, to laugh, to re relax. But generally, I'm really rigid inside. I'm a lot more rigid, and I'm a mathematician by education. Actually, I went to school in Binghamton, New York, studied mathematics. So, okay. um, uh, I, I don't know. I, I I just you know like to relax. I, I walk. Uh, I listen to a number of audio books uh, while I walk, and especially now during COVID, has mm -hmm. become a routine. I walk one and a half hours a day. It, it's it's a big deal. There are many books. Um, uh, hard to say well, what, what's the what's the best book. I, it really depends on. I'm not going to give you a book because there's so many good ones. So I'm just going to yeah. tell you personally, walking helps me a lot. And and um, while I walk it, you know, it's the Wall Street Journal. It, it could be, you know, many books. It could be spiritual books, could be a books. Don't laugh now, but back Soviet Union versus America. And I will always hated the Soviet Union. I always wanted to get out of there. It was a terrible. So I am an American, and I'm American at heart. Awesome. And I, I think they are just terrible over there. And they proved they just they those systems don't work. Right. Yeah. But uh, I could tell you, I even listen. I've listened to it many times, and it gives you really wise lessons. The Hunt for Red October. Oh, most of you know the 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 movie. Oh, yeah. and, and the, book. the movie. Never read the book, but love the movie. <laughs> uh, the book is even better than the movie. I have to say, although the movie is pretty good. So, is it based? Is that based on a true story? Uh it's supposed to be fiction. I don't know if Soviets ever built that kind of a okay. submarine, but I'm sure. Okay. As they say, fiction or a joke, and I, I'll talk yeah. about the joke. The joke yeah. has a share of joke, and the rest is the truth. There was some truth to this. So. Okay, all right. I didn't mean to get you off topic there, but that's. But it is so important to fill your mind with good things. You know what, too, yeah, Mike? Walk, I was thinking. Walk. We... That, that's that's what I would say right now. Walk as much as you can, and you think better when you walk, and I think better when I walk, and most people think right. uh, much better for some reason. Uh, your walking, the physical exercise, yeah. helps you think. I think it's important too that you said, I actually like that you said, I'm not going to pick one book because the truth is that's all relevant to the person, where they are in their life, where they are mentally. You know, if I, if, if, if I'm struggling to, to figure out my life and I'm really in a turmoil state all the time and you tell me to read, you know, good to great by Jim Collins or whatever, you tell me to read, you know, or it wouldn't, it wouldn't even resonate with me. I'd be like, that doesn't make sense. But you, you have to find where you are in life and find the next step and find a book that takes you that next step. And that's then I think point. that's what, that's the best way to, to give advice on books. Yeah, exactly. So right, right now I'm reading this book, if you could see, Mastering the Market Cycles. Okay. Howard right. Marks. Yeah. So this is, again, this is about, even though I don't, Particularly, I'm not a huge fan of, a fan of stock markets. I just have no control over it. That's one thing. If you're right. going to ask me why real estate, there's one word 
it, it explains it predict well control and predictability right as an yeah. investor you have decent stock markets you don't you could have a great month you can have a horrible month and most people can't time the market the right way so they wind up making returns are generally worse and then if you you know you, yeah i invest in the index it's as far as i can go because individual stock picking is not my forte but i love real estate as you said control and predictability you, you, yeah. predictability of outcome is a whole lot better but i do read the books on um stock market I, I enjoy it so and the hunt for red october and I've, I've i've listened and read virtually every book out there um uh about you know submarines and warfare and uh so you know, that's 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 my thing i i do like yeah. you know i don't know if it's, it's going to appeal to other people but i enjoy no, no, no. it that's the point though is that i think you have to find you know, I think it's good that you read stuff that takes your mind away from stuff that lately we don't do a lot of TV watching. We've done some binge watching at home at night. We'll watch it. We get about one hour a night in after the kids go, after to, bed. The kids go to bed if we're lucky. So, but we, you know, and I, I judge a good show on if it could take me yeah. out of the real estate mind because I'm always thinking about business. And if you catch me for an hour and I'm not thinking, I'm like, oh, that was refreshing. I had a break for a minute. You know, you didn't have to always be thinking because like, a, a show or a book or whatever you're doing kind of takes you away from it. So I think it's so important that we spend time to keep ourselves mentally strong, you know, and whatever, whatever that is for us, we have to do that. Yeah, but I do, I'll give you one book, one book that I, I sort of like in this environment, um, 1,000 Houses uh, by uh, uh, Mitch uh, Stevens. He talks, it's a still a financing concept, like we talked uh, about. One th okay, I haven't, uh, I'll have to read that. I think it's 1,000houses.com. It, it's basically a way to get into seller financing. He's all about, uh, seller financing. So you, you you could, you know, the basic concept is this. You find a house, using an example, I don't know if it's upstate New York, 50,000 bucks, right? It's a little rundown, you know, you, you basically uh, clean it up, do some minor, minor innovation, put in 10K, you're all in for 60. You put it on the market for $100,000 on rent. So what, what, what would it, $1,000 a month rent, you can, instead of paying the rent, now you can own the house. Mm -hmm. yeah. You could actually own the house for the same thousand dollars a month, sure. and you 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 put them on a payment plan. But your cost basis is sixty. They're paying you, uh, they're paying you a hundred. And more often, if you bought that house um, with seller financing, so the seller sold it to you for fifty, you put ten k in, and you create a wrap, and you're charging interest on, on a a hundred, and mm -hmm. you're paying on fifty. Yep. It's a cash flow play. The whole thing is a cash flow play. And if they ever prepay you early, then suddenly you get a big check. Yeah. That concept is pretty powerful. Uh, I don't use it much in New York City, very difficult, but it does work in smaller rural markets, maybe upstate New York. Uh, yeah. I think Mitch Stevens is in Texas, or used to be. Okay. I'll have to check that book out. That's a, that's a good one for our, our listeners to listen to. So cool. Well, listen, I I appreciate you being here, Jay. I got to learn a lot about you. It's great. And like I said, it was as right before we started the call. I said, oh, yeah, we were in the same room at, at our mastermind that we do. So and now I remember you and uh, I remember Big Mike. They'll call you Big Mike, which is great. So to everybody one last time how they can reach you. BigMikeFund.com. Uh, BigMikeFund.com. Big Mike Big Mike Fund with, an a, with a D on the end. With Big a Mike D, yeah. You, you can schedule time to chat again. Uh, generally speaking, uh, just, you know, we, we're not looking to do more loans. If you're looking for financing, I'm not the right person for you. If you have some capital to put to work and you're on a credit investor, we can have a conversation. Okay. Beyond that, I do have a podcast, Big Mike Fund podcast. So if you go to bigmikefund.com, you can navigate from there to the podcast. I only do, do two episodes a month. I don't know how exciting it is. I, I usually talk to real estate people. Like You could come back on my, on my podcast. We could okay. talk about investing in upstate new york love to awesome well mike i appreciate you being here today thanks so much for your story i know it's gonna i know you get people's minds churning here today a lot of good content and we appreciate you being here so yes absolutely all right thanks everybody we'll thank you kindly you got it and we'll uh, everybody we'll see you next week on the real estate of mind show see you then make sure you like and subscribe and leave us a review and leave us your questions and comments and we will personally answer and please share it to anyone you think could benefit you can find us all over social media at Glenn and Amber Schwarm. We'll see you next week.